All right, welcome to our session um, entitled Lessons Learned from Creating the 2020 HIV AIDS Comprehensive Needs Assessment. Um, we wanna give quick introductions. Um, my name is Jacob Melson, everybody calls me Jake. I'm the data policy analyst at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I've worked at DHS since March, 2019 when this needs assessment started that we're gonna talk about today. Um, because everything has been so challenging lately, we wanted to give a personal examples of things we've done for our own self-care. And one of the things that I've done a lot um, this spring and summer is I've ridden my bike a lot. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Darren so he can introduce himself. All right, thanks, Jake. Hello, everyone. My name is Darren Rolls. My pronouns are he and him. I am the manager of the HIV support section at the Department of Human Services, um, where I oversee the Part B award. Um, I've been with DHS for just a couple of years, but have been doing HIV work since the mid 90s. My first role in HIV was hands on caregiving for people at end stage AIDS at that point. Um, then did many years of community work as a case manager and other roles before coming to the state to administer the Ryan White Award. Um, uh, a thing that I have done for self-care during these interesting times is I've tried to replicate the decompressing time of a commute where I would listen to music by going on morning and afternoon walks to kind of mark the end of my day. So put on some good music, go for a nice walk to start the day, go for a nice walk to end the day and try to help keep them, A, recharge myself and keep some separation between my personal life and work life, which all happen in the same space now. All right, well, um, that is us and we are going to dive into our content now. And we'll be turning off the video for the rest of the presentation and be back during the Q&A. All right, so I wanna quickly go over our learning outcomes. We wanna describe ways to get meaningful input from people with HIV and planning council members when conducting joint needs assessments. We wanna identify what worked well and what can be improved the next time a needs assessment is conducted. We also wanna discuss recommendations other states and TGAs can make when conducting needs assessments. I'm gonna hand it over to Darren, who's gonna talk a little bit more about um, the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Great, thanks, Jake. And I think you are in control of the slide advances, if you could advance the slides. Um, and I'll give some background. So the Minnesota Department of Human Services, HIV support section is the Health Resources and Services Administration HIV AIDS Bureau, Ryan White, Part B grant recipient. Um, in some audiences, I have to unpack that a lot, but I'm guessing at the Ryan White Conference, you know what most of those terms mean. So the Department of Human Services receives the Part B grant to administer ADAP and core medical and support services throughout Minnesota. Um, I'll share a few data points to give a sense of the scope of Minnesota's program. Um, with our program HH, Sorry, our AIDS Drug Assistance Program and Insurance Assistance Insurance Access Program is also known as Program HH in Minnesota. Um, through that program, we serve many clients. Some just a couple of data points in federal fiscal year 2018. We assisted with the payment of almost 5,200 insurance premiums for 632 unduplicated clients. And in that same time period, we assisted with payments for over 50,000 drug prescriptions for 1,881 clients. Um, in Minnesota, we also fold in our dental services, mental health services, and medical nutrition services into that program. So uh, those other needs are met through Program HH as well. Um, and then we have our contracts team who administer or who first facilitate the administration of contracts to our community partners. We currently have over 34 contracts in place. Some of these contracts are interagency agreements with other, other governmental partners, including the Minnesota Department of Health and Hennepin County Public Health. 
In Minnesota, we're a little unique in that the health department is a separate state agency. So our partners at the Minnesota Department of Health receive the CDC prevention funding for state prevention work. And we work very closely with them to align our Ryan White services efforts. Our community partners include a range of community-based and nonprofit organizations, some of whom are HIV specific, culturally specific, and regionally specific. These services reached about 4,000 unduplicated individuals in 2019. And just to save a little bit of time for the rest of the presentation, when we're talking about the work of the Minnesota Department of Human Services, we'll just refer to them to us as DHS. Um, of course, the Part B work administered by DHS connects with the Part A program in Minnesota. We will describe the Part A in our state in a future slide, uh, but just again, to give a little sense of the scope of our services, the total number of Ryan White clients receiving services in Minnesota through Part B and A has been increasing every year since 2015. In 2015, there was 4,088 unduplicated clients served by the two parts. And in 2019, we were up to 4,726 clients or just over 50% of the people living with HIV in Minnesota. And I will turn it over to Jake for some for the next content. So wanted to go over some background information on the prevalence or existing cases of people living with HIV in Minnesota. This is a report from the Minnesota Department of Health. And this is the first table in the report. Um, you can access the report. We have a link at the back of our slideshow. But what I want to draw your attention to is in 2019, there were 9,178 people living with HIV in Minnesota. And out of those 9,178 people, 17% or 1,587 lived in greater Minnesota. So the vast majority of the people living with HIV live in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, next slide. Um, So this is from the same um, report by the Minnesota Department of Health on the previous slide. And you can see that communities of color are disproportionately impacted by HIV. You can see that um, the black, non-African born, black, African born, Hispanic, and American Indian populations all have much higher rates of HIV and AIDS than white non-Hispanic populations. So the black non-African born non-Hispanic population has an HIV AIDS rate that is over 12.3 times higher than that of the white non-Hispanic population. The black African born population non-Hispanic, which is unique to Minnesota has, a has an HIV AIDS rate that is over 15.6 times higher than that of whites. The Hispanic population, which can be of any race has an HIV AIDS rate that was over 4.1 times higher and American Indian non-Hispanic population has an HIV rate that is over 2.1 times higher than that of whites. The main point we wanna make with this slide is the rate is much higher and populations of color and indigenous populations are disproportionately impacted by HIV. All right, wanted to go over some incidence data and incidence is the new cases. And I don't wanna read this out loud to everyone, but I do want you to know that cases have remained stable. They're decreasing. The five-year average was 296 from 2015 to 2019, and now it's gone down to 275. And wanted to also draw attention to males account for 72% of all new HIV cases in Minnesota in 2019. And male to male sex remains the main risk factor for all males of all ages. And over half, 61% of new HIV cases are communities of color.
So I wanted to provide a little bit of information on um, Hennepin County Public Health, who is the Part A grant recipient. Um, we partner with Hennepin County on a number of projects, including this project. And the important thing to know is over here, you see a picture of the state of Minnesota. There's 11 counties that are part of the Minneapolis-St. Paul Transitional Grant Area in Minnesota, and then two counties in Wisconsin. The majority of people living with HIV live in Minnesota, or live in the TGA, excuse me. Um, that previous report didn't break it down by TGA, but it was saying that 17% of people lived living with HIV live in greater Minnesota. So I wanted to talk quickly about the council, um, the Minnesota Council for HIV AIDS Care and Prevention. Um, you can see the acronym there, M-C-H-A-C-P. Um, in this presentation, I'll just refer to it as the council. Here's the website if you wanna know more about the council. But the council includes people living with HIV, HIV service organizations, healthcare providers, and then staff from the Minnesota Department of Human Services, where Darren and I work, staff from Hennepin County, who we collaborated on this project with, and staff from the Minnesota Department of Health, who provided all those surveillance data that I went through on previous slides. Um, the council includes a number of various committees as well. And since I started last March, I've att attended the majority of the needs assessment and evaluation committee meetings as well as monthly council meetings. Um, I've attended other meetings as well, but here's a picture of the council. All right, so now I um, want to get into more of the, um, talk more about the needs assessment that we've talked about the background. So, HRSA, HAB, Ryan White, Part B, and Part A grant recipients are legislatively required to conduct a comprehensive needs assessment. And according to our Ryan White Part B manual, um, Ryan White HIV AIDS programs Part B needs assessments is the process of collecting information about the needs of people living with HIV, both those receiving care and not in care. Steps involve gathering data from multiple sources on the number of HIV and AIDS cases, the needs and service barriers of people living with HIV, and current resources, both Ryan White and other, available to meet those needs. This information is then analyzed to identify what services are needed, what services are provided, what service gaps remain overall and for particular groups of people living with HIV. Um, so, DHS and Hennepin County have historically collaborated on previous needs assessments, which have been conducted every five years. The previous needs assessment was in 2015. We began collaborating on this needs assessment that we're gonna talk about throughout this presentation in March, 2019. Um, in addition, DHS has also conducted more focused needs assessments on different breakthrough issues in the past that have arisen between the five-year needs assessment cycles. And for example, DHS recently conducted a dental survey with Ryan White clients across the state. So one of the first things we did was we agreed on the project approach and the project goal. And our project approach was basically a collaborative consensus-based approach. And if one government agency needed something, the other agency would participate. For example, we went through the DHS Institutional Review Board. That wasn't a requirement for our Ryan White Part A Hennepin County colleagues, but since we were both collaborating on the project, we both went through that process together. Um, our project goal, that DHS and Hennepin County will survey a large enough sample size to draw statistically significant conclusions about defined subpopulations of people living with HIV. The needs assessment will answer the following questions for people living with HIV. 
provide information on the social determinants of health for these subpopulations, identify met, under met, or under, under met service needs of people living with HIV. So we originally planned to use these data to help the council prioritize and allocate services, but because of delays in data collection and our time frame, we weren't able to do that. So we're going to be using all these data from this needs assessment in the survey to help make decisions in our Ryan White system. We're gonna use the data for reporting and federal grant applications. In addition, we're going to share summary data with community, with the community and stakeholders to inform and support our work. All right, another thing that I wanna talk about is stratified samples. I worked on these with my colleague, Aaron Peterson at Hennepin County and Jared Shank at the Minnesota Department of Health also helped work on these and provided data. Um, so stratified samples are important um, because we wanna receive a, 664 completed surveys so we can draw statistically significant conclusions about defined subpopulations living with HIV. We want to collect 366 surveys from people living with HIV in the TGA where there's a lot more people living with HIV and we want to collect 298 surveys from people living with HIV in greater Minnesota. It's really important we want all of the communities who are impacted by HIV to per proportionately complete the sample. It's really crucial that we have a sample and have data that are representative of the HIV community. Um, as I said before, HIV disproportionately impacts different communities in Minnesota. This includes Black African-born populations, Black non-African-born populations, Hispanic people, and American Indian populations. And with all these populations, it's really important to look at intersectionality as well. Men who have sex with men made up 48% of HIV AIDS cases in Minnesota in 2019. The next most frequently reported risk factor, unknown risk, accounted for 28% of the cases. Again, our goal of having stratified samples for each subpopulation is to have an ideal number of surveys to collect from that subpopulation, both in the TGA and greater Minnesota. So to give an example, black African-American men who have sex with men make up 10% of people living with HIV in the TGA, but only 4.3% of people living with HIV in greater Minnesota. Therefore, the goal is to collect 37 surveys from Black African-born MSM in the TGA and 13 in Greater Minnesota. We're working right now to make sure our stratified sample size goals for each subpopulation are being met. Um, we initially had a hard time getting African-born populations to complete the survey, but we're now working on that and have gotten responses from Black African-born populations. Um, in addition, we have now received enough surveys from white women that we don't need to target them anymore. All right, so I wanted to talk about survey design. So DHS, Hennepin County, and the council all reviewed the 2015 needs assessment. There was a group of staff who, uh, uh, or an internal group of staff from the government agencies and a council representative where we met numerous times. Um, but one of the first things we did was before taking the data and the survey to the committee, we reviewed the 2015 needs assessment and decided which questions to keep and which questions to remove. Um, we agreed to remove questions that weren't really relevant or there was a lot of missing data in the survey. We also, at our initial meeting with the government partners, 
started brainstorming different variables such as sexual orientation, gender identity, sex at birth, et cetera, that we wanted to include in the survey. And then we ended up creating a list of these variables and started searching for different um, indicators or ways to ask those specific questions. Um, my colleague Aaron and I <coughs> divided the list up. So we would each find the, <coughs> excuse me, three or four best ways to ask a question. And in order to do that, um, we reviewed national surveys, such as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, um, the American Community Survey, as well as we reviewed needs assessments from other states. And our whole purpose by reviewing existing surveys was so we didn't recreate the wheel, but we also wanted to make sure that anything that we found had valid and reliable indicators. Again, um, just wanted to give you these definitions so you had them for your review, but was really emphasizing with validity, are we measuring what we wanna measure? And reliability, are we getting the same results if we're doing the same test over and over? Um, you can see the example of a CD4 counter viral load in the last six months is a valid measure if someone's retaining care. And then reliability. I talked a lot with the committee about, um, you know, being a type 1 diabetic and testing my blood and testing my blood a number of times to make sure that I would get a result that was pretty close. And anytime the result was way off, okay, this isn't a reliable measure. Um, just really wanted to emphasize why we were looking at existing surveys. Um, social determinants of health. Um, I think we talked about social determinants of health and our project goal. Um, we all know that health is a lot more than just the absence of disease. According to the World Health Organization, Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, social determinants of health, there's various definitions, but it's all about the conditions where people live, work, play, that influences their health risks and their health outcomes. Um, the social determinants of health is a system of interacting variables that impact an individual or population's health, and with social determinants of health, the goal is to understand the variables that can help individuals and populations achieve their optimal health. Um, the Ryan White funding system fills in gaps in care that are not covered by other funding sources and addresses the social determinants of health that contribute to health related disparities that we've previously talked about. Um, you can see a number of different examples here. Again, this is just one model. There's many different models of the social determinants of health, but there's a number of different variables um, such as employment, income, medical bills, housing, transportation, uh, food, hunger, um, social integration, healthcare coverage, what that looks like. We included a number of different variables um, for the social determinants of health. Um, here's a slide that my colleague Aaron put together at Hennepin County and it's showing on the left hand side you can see all those variables different examples of social determinants of health and you can see on the right hand side how those match with Brian White services. Um, not every social determinant of health is addressed or through a Ryan White service, but most are. Um, the little asterisk for criminal justice, it's important to know that different services, including medical case management, non-medical case management, and housing can be offered before an individual is released. Um, And now we're going to switch gears and we're gonna talk about 
describe all the ways to get meaningful input from people with HIV and planning council members when conducting joint needs assessments. All right, so engagement. So we stressed throughout this entire process to every single group that we met with. And again, we started this in March, 2019. So we've been working on this for um, a year and five months, but we've stressed throughout to every single group that the needs assessment is really a golden opportunity to hear from people living with HIV. It's not often that we ask people with HIV to tell us what their issues are. And we really, this is a golden opportunity for us to collect these data and to make data-driven decisions. So we facilitated numerous meetings with the council, the Minnesota Council for HIV AIDS Care and Prevention, and all of the subcommittees to gain consensus, not only on the goals of the needs assessment, but also what indicators to include. Um, this process ensured the needs assessment was applic applicable to not only people living with HIV, but also met federal grant requirements. Um, we worked the most with the needs assessment and evaluation committee to create the survey. And this committee helped create the survey through democracy activities, where literally my colleague and I would research the three or four best ways to ask specific indicators and then the group would vote with dots and then facilitate a discussion on which indicator they liked the best for each variable. Um, the group also did a lot of work reviewing the stratified samples, giving feedback on the methodology, where to reach people. Um, the committee was very actively engaged and gave a lot of good feedback. Um, the Disparities Elimination Committee we presented sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex at birth questions to the Disparities Elimination Committee. Um, this caucus had a, or this committee had a gender caucus and was the best committee to ask for feedback on these questions. Again, they did democracy, facilitated a discussion on why we chose what we chose. Also, the group was very interested in methodology and really working on how are we going to reach these different subpopulations. Um, the last committee is the Community Voices Committee. And we presented to this committee in March 2020, shortly before COVID-19 hit Minnesota, and facilitated an activity where we asked um, committee members to provide feedback on how to reach different subpopulations who have been more difficult to reach in the past. Um, the Minnesota Council for HIV AIDS Care and Prevention, they meet monthly and we talked about the survey with them numerous times. In December, 2019, the council pilot tested the survey and gave feedback. Um, this was really important because not only did council members identify potential issues when the survey was being entered into Qualtrics and some of the questions you know, had to get switched but it also having council members take the survey was really valuable. So there was buy-in. And after data collection started, the interns who we've hired have reported on preliminary data that's been collected thus far at council meetings and needs assessment and evaluation committee meetings. All right. so. What did we end up with? We ended up with a survey that is approximately 60 questions. It includes questions on demographics, the social determinants of health, which we've talked a lot about with um, different examples with income, education, employment, transportation issues, access issues. Um, it includes questions on HIV health outcomes, retention and care, viral suppression, there's also questions on co-occurring conditions um, and behavioral health issues. Um, and then there's a number of questions on Ryan White services. All of the questions, the survey and all of the questions are optional. 
Um, anyone can choose not to take the survey. It is confidential. You're only allowed to take the survey one time and you can receive a $25 gift card for your time and effort. So I wanted to show our promotional materials that you can see. Um, Hennepin County worked on creating these. Um, it shows who's eligible, it has a link to take it. You see the QPR code. Um, you see there's a phone number and an email address set up for people that have questions. Um, so just so people in the audience know, Hennepin County, the Hennepin County assessment team were the group who programmed our survey into Qualtrics for us. And Hennepin County is proctoring three interns who are helping us collect these data. All right, so I kind of talked about some of this already. Um, we were going to launch in March 2020, um, exactly a year after we had started the project. Um, we had everything programmed into Qualtrics. We're ready to go live. Um, we had been approved by our institutional review board. We were working on hiring interns, creating plans on having them go from subrecipient agency to subrecipient agency to collect data. Um, and told you a little bit about the community voices meeting that my colleague and I, I facilitated. We gave out promotional materials and then basically coronavirus hit Minnesota right after this. So although we planned to launch in 2020, our launch was slightly delayed. And although we had collected some online surveys, um, with coronavirus, we had to deal with what do we do now that we've created all these plans and they have to switch. Um, it wasn't possible to send interns to subrecipient agencies because many of the subrecipient agencies were closed or not seeing clients in person. So we had to adapt to the COVID-19 environment and um, Hennepin County DHS staff, we had a call about what are we going to do? And then we had another call with the subrecipients in April or May and decided that we were gonna push forward and that this was the ideal time to collect these data. So we did hire the interns in May, 2020 and worked on creating a phone survey. Originally, the survey was only going to be done online. And also we were gonna have some paper surveys, but we went to a phone methodology as well. Um, and the phone was out of the concern that different populations who are disproportionately impacted, it was harder to reach them before. So we wanted to reach them in person and then wanted to switch to being able to reach them on the phone. Um, so we worked on creating a phone survey. We rewrote parts of our informed consent, which was too lengthy. We deleted some of the questions that were unnecessary and made some of the questions um, more open-ended. We submitted all of our changes to the instrument and the methodology to the IRB. Um, and basically our changes was to have subrecipients contact clients and obtain their consent to be interviewed and to participate. Um, this was approved by the DHS Institutional Review Board. So now we have interns who are contacting subrecipients across the state and sending them lists of clients who they serve, who could be potential participants to complete the 2020 needs assessment. Like I've said throughout this presentation, we're really targeting different subpopulations to meet our stratified sample size goals for each subpopulation. We don't want a survey that is just white MSM living in the Twin Cities to be the only people to complete our survey. Another reason that we're working so closely with subrecipients is because subrecipients work with clients all the time. They have the relationship with the clients. They have current contact information. And that's why we're targeting the different subpopulations and having um, those subrecipients work with individuals on that list to see if they want to take the survey.
All right. So I might have covered some of this before, but as I said, Hennepin County is working on um, collecting all the data for the 2020 HIV AIDS needs assessment. And staff at Hennepin are coordinating all the logistics, which has been really challenging since everyone's working remotely the vast majority of the time since um, COVID-19. And as I've said before, the HIV community in Minnesota is really diverse. Therefore, we wanna make sure that we're being culturally responsive and also wanna make sure that we're being accessible. One of the things that was highlighted the first time we went through the IRB was accessibility. And my colleagues at Hennepin County worked on a number of accessibility issues such as the QPR code you saw, the link for the survey, an email address and telephone number for which the interns use so they can communicate with participants and others. Um, in addition, the interns are able to use a language line so they can read the survey in English to a translator who will translate this survey and whatever questions into another language the participant speaks and then the translator will tell the intern what the participant said in English. Um, it's been translated into Spanish. Um, myself and another colleague at Hennepin County um, did training when the first interns first started um, just on best practices with phone interviews, making sure that people are agreeing to participate, that they're being conducted the same way every single time etc. And now we're going to flip gears again and we're going to talk about what worked well and what can be improved the next time a needs assessment is conducted. So I think one of the biggest lessons learned is time and everything takes a little bit longer when two government agencies are collaborating with each other and the council and its various committees. Um, we spent approximately nine months from March until December 2019 creating the survey. Um, it was pilot tested in December 2020. We presented to the DHS IRB in December 2020, and the IRB came back and said, we wanna know more about this. We'd like you to change that. We made those changes. It was approved in February. Again, like I talked about our launch in 2020 that got slightly delayed because of coronavirus, but we did lean into our subrecipients and asked them what's feasible, what's realistic, and they really pushed us forward to collect these data and to move forward with a um, slightly delayed time frame. So the intern started in May 2020. We submitted an application to amend our IRB application in May 2020 so we could conduct phone interviews. That was approved in June 2020. And in June, um, the interns first started collecting phone surveys. Um, we recently decided um, because of time and the amount of time it takes to do things, we wanted to extend our data collection a little bit more since we have great, op great interns and they've been doing a great job, wanted to extend that to make sure that we can reach our goal of collecting 664 surveys. So, um, now we're going to be collecting data until October 2020 right now. All right, another lesson learned, engagement. Um, Buy-in equals better outcomes. Um, be more intentional about getting involvement from all stakeholders um, from the beginning. So, our initial meeting with the needs assessment and evaluation committee didn't go quite as we planned. And we learned from that meeting that you can't go into a first meeting and have everything laid out. It's really, really important to ask the group what they want included, what they're interested in. And the first meeting should be more of a brainstorm. 
And after that first meeting that didn't go according to plan, um, myself, um, my colleague Aaron from Hennepin County and my colleague Carissa um, from Hennepin County, the council um, coordinator, we had a call with the co-chairs and decided to facilitate that we would facilitate a dot democracy or dot voting activity. And this was really a hit, a really good way to engage the committee. So we met monthly with this committee. And like I said, Aaron and I would present, here's the three or four best indicators for this variable or the ways to ask these questions. Like here's the four best ways to ask um, gender identity, what do you think? And then people would vote with dots and we'd facilitate conversations afterwards where it was really interesting. Sometimes the group would actually change its mind and be like, actually we're think because of the discussion, this might be a better question or it's really important. We need to add this attribute. We need to add this response option. Otherwise we're not going to, we're gonna be missing a bunch of data. Um, like I said, needs assessment and evaluation committee, provide feedback on the stratified samples, the methodology, promotional materials, um, suggestions on where to reach different subpopulations. So I think we've done a really great way of engaging. Um, it's just really thinking, engaging from the beginning and how that's set up. Um, and we should have engaged the Community Voices Committee earlier when we were creating the survey. Um, the Community Voices Committee, because of um, their meeting schedule and how it lined up when we were creating the survey, um, we didn't actually go to them and present to them until we were asking for feedback on how to reach priority populations. And that was a missed opportunity. Again, the meeting didn't go according to plan, but we were flexible and got good feedback especially on ways to reach different populations. A uh, number of committee members took promotional materials. Um, we did suggest that um, they take it and then tell others in their network to take it. We wish we would have just engaged them a little sooner so they could champion the survey from the beginning. And I have been talking a lot, so I'm going to hand it over to Darren and Darren's gonna tell you about our um, lessons learned on going through the Institutional Review Board. All right, thanks, Jake. Yeah, we didn't divide up these slots very well, or these slides very well, so thank you for talking for so long. Um, IR IRBs, so for folks that are familiar with research and evaluation, you are probably familiar with Institutional Review Boards, or IRBs, and they are in place to, assure, to ensure that research does not harm participants. Um, the nature of an HIV needs assessment, of course, we are seeking information from people living with HIV. So just engaging in the survey process is disclosing health information. Um, and then within that needs assessment, we are asking sensitive questions about sensitive topics, chemical health, mental health, safety, et cetera. Um, so knowing um, both that we were working on health-related issues and asking sensitive questions, we knew from the beginning that this project would have to be approved through the DHS IRB. Um, Jake talked a little bit about what that timeline looked like. So we prepared our application. Um, you see on your screen uh, and one of the pages from that application. Um, we both prepared the responses and then the supporting documentation that would go with that application. Um, things like draft recruitment materials, survey questions, um, the survey instrument, things like that. And then shipped that off to the IRB and met with them in person. Um, that was a really interesting meeting. Um, it was great to have the the IRB at DHS brings to people together from across the agency with different perspectives and levels of expertise. So there's research expertise, data privacy expertise, um, subject matter expertise. So it was a chance to have um, you know, an outside panel both look at our project to make sure that it was conceptually sound, that it was, um, wasn't causing undue risk to participants and then help us really 
um, think through some areas that weren't as well developed. Um, Jake mentioned accessibility. Another thing that I remember, of course, since we work in Ryan White services, we think about the folks that we serve. And part of the point of needs assessment is learning the needs of people who aren't yet in our system so we can better meet the needs of all people who are eligible for services living with HIV in our state. So some really good conversations came out of that. Of course, as Jake said, that also led to some additional information that we had to supply to the board to get their full approval. Um, again, that was received in February 2020. And then as Jake said, and as we all know, COVID happened and our world changed. So we had to change the application again, or do an updated application describing what our new processes would be for recruitment, describing the changes to the survey instrument for phone use and all that good stuff. Um, the, again, the IRB approval or the IRB process really helped us strengthen our design in places that it wasn't quite ready to go yet. Um, and it added time. So um, as with you all, many of you are in government roles and you know, sometimes these processes don't move quickly. So um, one of our lessons learned was just to be even, we were very prepared for our initial IRB meeting and application submission. And there were things we learned through that process that when we do it again, we would have tighter and closer to finish when we engage the IRB. Um, another lesson with that is, um, at least in our institution, the IRB is pretty accessible and pretty responsive. So there were maybe things that we could have asked questions of before we submitted the application that would have had it closer to being um, approval ready when, they, when it got to them. And those are the thoughts on the IRB. So we can advance to the next slide. And there's, so subrecipients. We learned some key lessons with subrecipients, and some of this overlaps with our lessons with engagement. But um, our subrecipient program staff are the instrumental folks who can engage clients in a process like a needs assessment. These are the folks on the front lines already working with people in the community who have their trust and have that relationship to engage in a process like this. But of course, those staff have really full jobs already, and probably different levels of interest and understanding of the importance of a process like a needs assessment and research. So their buy-in may look different. Um, as if, so I mentioned in my introduction, my first kind of, my first Ryan White role was as an HIV medical case manager. And I remember from those years of work, um, when I went through, when I was, when a needs assessment happened as I was a case manager, it put a lot of extra work on my plate. So figuring out how to bring that information into client appointments, how to help clients engage with the process, did add work to an already pretty full plate. Um, and here we are asking our subrecipients to do a little bit of extra work for us. So um, kind of getting to that engagement piece, there is a lesson learned would have been, is the importance of bringing in subrecipient staff a little bit earlier in the process. And so they have a piece in designing this journey. Um, they were able to give some good feedback as we were looking at pivoting during COVID on how things might look in the COVID environment. And that increased engagement on earlier in the process would have built that buy-in. So they're, um, so more people were ready to go with recruitment when we actually went live with the process. Um, so our past months of work have been complicated and ever-changing. Our world first changed due to COVID-19. Then George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. Minneapolis and St. Paul, as you likely know, experienced the protests and civil unrest at an unprecedented scale. We've seen that movement spread throughout the nation. During the, during the immediate aftermath of George Floyd, um, many of the clients we serve and some of our sub lived in neighborhoods and some of our subrecipient organizations operated out of neighborhoods that were most impacted by the civil unrest. There was loss of pharmacies, loss of grocery stores, property damage to many buildings. Um, and it led to a disruption, another disruption in service access that we weren't seeing. Between COVID, and the aftermath of George Floyd, 
we had to be a nimble and responsive system, which we all know is really hard in a big bureaucracy. Through this period of time, we had weekly subrecipient check-in phone calls. And to help plan for our COVID CARES funding use, we did a very brief needs assessment that we asked case managers to administer with their clients to inform how we use our CARES fund. Um, we developed this with their, we got feedback on this process through these phone calls. And by developing that process with them, they were really engaged and really responsive and really helped us get a lot of surveys completed to inform what we do with our, our COVID funding. Um, in regards to the George Floyd aftermath, we didn't do a formal survey process, but we did gather a lot of anecdotal data to inform how we needed to respond our system or how we needed to adjust our system to make sure people's needs were being met. Um, so some great partnership with subrecipients that can reinforce that lesson of doing with um, and bringing the subrecipients along for the journey to have that buy-in. Um, and of course, at the same time, during this work, some subrecipients have had challenges in supporting the needs assessment processes. Staff turnover is required ongoing training on the needs assessment project. Staff fatigue and high workload impacts the ability of folks to support client engagement. And some people just aren't that interested in research processes or are fatigued with research processes. And that can be a barrier to engaging subrecipients in connecting their clients to a process like this. And again, these challenges could be mitigated by engaging earlier and more intentionally with subrecipients. Back to you, Jake. All right. Um, another lesson learned, um, employees or volunteers. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, um, with employees, some of those potential benefits and costs. And on the right, you can see volunteers. Um, we talked about this a lot on whether or not to hire temporary employees to help us collect the survey or to have ambassadors or essentially volunteers from the council help collect data um, who had helped collect data on the previous needs assessment. So we went back and forth and we had potential concerns about potential survey bias, which we wanted to avoid because we want all we don't want any of the interviewers to influence the results. So really decided we needed to hire short term temporary employees or these interns to help us collect data, um, public health grad students, and we could train them to collect data so data would be con conducted excuse me, collected consistently. Um, as we said before, it's been hard to reach African born populations. Therefore, we've had to think of different strategies to encourage African born populations to participate. And one of those is having their medical case manager being on the beginning of a call when they're transferred to an intern and an interpreter to take the survey. And this way, not only would it help facilitate the opportunity for a participant to take the survey, but it also eliminates social desirability bias when the medical case manager hangs up. Again, these are lessons learned as we're actively learning them as we collect data. Um, all right, now the last part of our presentation is we wanna discuss recommendations other states and TGAs can implement when conducting needs assessments. So the first one is project management and strong project management. Um, it's really, really important. This is a really, really large project. Um, it's important to have strong project management. Um, so we recommend at the beginning creating a project timeline and mapping out how long you think it'll take to do different things like facilitating meetings to develop the survey or creating promotional materials. How long will it take you to work through your review board processes? I would create all those and then add a little bit of extra time, um, especially when you're collaborating with two different government agencies and the council and all of its committees. 
um, it's really important to multitask and to realize that things will take longer than expected. It's really important to delegate responsibilities. Not everyone can work on everything at the same time, like survey questions or promotional materials, working on accessibility issues, getting phone numbers created, emails set up, etc. cetera. Um, another thing, it's really important to have a shared space to store documents. Um, I don't know how many times this happened where it's like, okay, is this the latest and greatest version of the survey or is that an old version? Is this a promotional materials before we added, you can only take the survey one time. Um, so we put a lot of our documents into Basecamp and then we're meeting regularly. We have regular scheduled phone calls to make sure that we're on the same page um, and that everyone's up to date. And again, it's just really important to be cognizant that things will take longer than expected. Um, All right, more recommendations. Um, engagement. We've talked about the importance of community engagement throughout this entire presentation and how we engaged the council and all of its different committees. Uh, one thing I really, really like about Ryan White is the requirement that councils are representative of the epidemic in the region and our combined council with Hennepin County, Minnesota Department of Health, and DHS, the council and all of its com committees are very diverse. So we're always getting diverse opinions and feedback. And I think we worked really hard to engage the council and all the different committees. Um, although not all of our meetings went according to plan, we were flexible and adapted. Um, the 2020 HIV AIDS Comprehensive Needs Assessment was really the first time that DHS, Hennepin County, and the Needs Assessment and Evaluation Committee worked so closely and collaboratively to conduct the needs assessment. Um, like I said, I started in March 2019 and had been at my current job for 10 minutes when the needs assessment started. Um, I had heard that the Needs Assessment and Evaluation Committee um, wasn't as talkative, but once we started doing democracy activities and facilitating those discussions, the room just lit up and you would have people who were so excited to participate. Like the group really looked forward to voting on all of the different indicators and then those discussions. Um, so would recommend true authentic community engagement, which is really, really hard. Um, but when it works, it works really well. And um, we couldn't have created this needs assessment without all of the different partners and that we worked with. Um, next slide is about subrecipients and I'm gonna hand it back to Darren and Darren can talk about subrecipients. Yes, thank you, Jake. Um, so I was just talking about subrecipients and there's kind of a theme here, um, partnering with them as they are the folks closest to the clients, we closest to the people who we want to engage in the survey. Um, so bringing them along early and bringing them along in a meaningful way. An additional element that I'll add to this, um, Jake showed some of the recruitment materials that we had developed that we would have given to subrecipients to help distribute, to raise awareness of the survey um, of the needs assessment. And of course, in the COVID environment, um, mass mailings aren't happening very often. People aren't handing out flyers at health fairs. So we kind of repackaged things to provide electronic Image, to, to provide electronic versions of recruitment materials to make it very easy for subrecipient organizations to raise awareness through their social media channels when they were sending emails to clients, things like that. So um, find ways to make it as easy as possible for subrecipients to help raise awareness of the needs assessment. And we'll go to the next slide, which I believe is still me. Um, so. Going through the IRB process takes time, but it is important. And depending on where you work, it may be mandatory. So of course, explore that with your institution. Um, some specific items that I wanted to call out. 
um, to support an efficient review, make sure when you get that first application in, you have the completed survey instrument. If you have to change your survey instrument, you have to go through the process again and get that approved. Really have a clear definition of your population and your sampling strategy. Um, if you are doing your survey through an interview, whether it be phone or in person, if we ever do work in person again, have that clearly described and laid out as well. So an IRB likes to see the text that people will, that the, admit, the survey administrator will use when introducing the survey, when moving into the consent form, all of that. Um, have your finalized consent form. Again, if you have to make a change to a document like that, it has to go back through the IRB and have finalized recruitment materials. Um, one last thing I will throw out, again, is engage with your IRB on the front end. When you think that you've got the package together of information, you can always reach out and say, hey, these are the things we're prepping to send. Is there anything missing here? IRBs will typically have an application that is very detailed. And we all know with applications, sometimes there's something that isn't clearly called out that is needed. So. Engaging with the IRB on the front end can make sure that you have a full package to get through the process as efficiently as possible. And back to you, Jake. Last recommendation. Um, like I said, um, we debated and went back and forth on hiring interns and what that process would look like and where they'd be housed. but. It is wonderful to have dedicated staff, to have three interns, public health interns in grad school who are working really hard to collect these data. The interns have sent promotional materials out electronically and also um, have been sending um, promotional materials out in the mail as well, which has been challenging with COVID-19. Um, they've been conducting phone interviews and they've been working really hard on those subrecipient lists or those lists so we can target the different populations, um, different populations in different areas of the state. Um, definitely, definitely recommend hiring staff and getting them onboarded um, sooner rather than later to um, help with the needs assessment. Their help has really been invaluable. And now um, we are going to um, open it up for questions. Um, first, here's the references. If you have any, if you're interested in looking at any of the reports I talked about or where any of the pictures came from. Um, but now we're going to open it up for questions. And before we do that, um, just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to our presentation on lessons learned from creating the 2020 um, HIV AIDS Conference of Needs Assessment.